Father, we want to feel your glory, God. We want to know you. We want to see you, Father. We want to know you. All parts of you. The shadows of God. The shelters of God, Father. The hidden places of God, Father. We want to see your glory. In our lives, we want to see your glory. In our story, we want to see your glory. In all facets of life, Father, we want to see you. We want to know you. We want to be with you, God. We don't want to be apart from you, Father. We want to be in the midst of everything you have going on, God. You be the center, Father, and we will orbit around you, Father. We want to be like the sun, Father. We thank you that you're worthy. God, somebody needs to be healed this morning. Somebody needs to be healed. Type, type that in if that's you. Say, I am healed. Prophetically speak that over your life right now. Say, I am healed. Somebody needs to be cured. Say, I am cured. The, the, the antidote has been given to me in my spirit and I am. I'm free. Somebody came shackled and bound. But you can say, God has released the shackles off of my hands and I have found freedom. Father, show us your glory. In the midst of my story, whether it's a good chapter or a bad chapter, Father, I want to see you, Father. Pressing on toward the mark. Leaving those things that are behind. Father, I don't want yesterday's blessings, Father. I want what you have for me today, God. I want a fresh anointing, Father. I want a renewed spirit, God. I want a new mind, God. I want to have fresh vision, Father. Give me 2020 vision for now. Even in the midst of 2020, I still want to see you, Father. Because I know you're the God of all things. God of health. God of comfort. God of wealth. God of desire. God of healing, God of power, God, you are everything. And we thank you, Father. We thank you. So this morning, as your scripture says, Father, to seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. We come seeking you, Father, all facets of you, saying we want to see you because we love you. And you said, after we seek ye first, the kingdom of God and its righteousness. You said all these other things, Father, that we desire, all of these other things, Father, that we want, all of these other things that we need, Father, they will be added unto thee. Say, I have been added to you. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. It adds to you. One more time, choir. Just sing, show us your glory. Write the vision below. Say, show us your glory. Just type that in. Show us your glory. Show us your glory. Let every burning heart be holy. Say, show me. Say, show me. Show me. Show me. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. In wonder and surrender we fall down. I say, we give you glory.
somebody just type in, I am grateful. I am grateful. I am grateful. I'm grateful for the trials that I'm in. I'm grateful for the season that I'm in. I'm grateful for the brokenness that's happened around me. I'm grateful for the people that left me. I'm grateful for the people that lost me. I'm grateful for the people that I've moved on for. I'm thankful for the brokenness in my family. I'm thankful for all of the things that are around me that are not looking right because I know it's not happening to me, but it's happening for me, God. And I thank you and I will give you glory. Father, I have learned to be content in all seasons, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether I have plenty or whether I lack, Father, whether I'm oppressed, deep pressed, in prison, or free, Father, I give you glory! transition. Father, we pray that the words from our lips, the meditations of our hearts will be a sweet sound as an offering offered unto you. And the church said, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 God is worthy, he is faithful, he is powerful, he is true, he is just, he is merciful, and he is great. Even as we're in the midst of this, this, this time of, of, of giving God glory, there's something else that we can give, and it's our offering time. It's, it's time for us to give unto God what God has given unto us. And in this season, as, as you prepare your hearts to give, it's, it's a spiritual act of worship to give unto God. Because what it's saying is I am releasing control of something and I'm giving it to you on a promise that you told us to test you in this. And you said, watch, if you test me in this, watch, I will, I'll do something that you, I will show you my glory. And so I'm, I'm praying that you see God's glory in the midst of your offering, in the midst of your blessing, in the midst of your tithe and your offering. Uh, as you give, I want you to know where your money is going. Uh, we have uh, a couple of things that we're working on. Right now, we're working on our prison ministry and being able to invest and be able to um, uh, reach out to those that are incarcerated. Uh, the other thing is hopefully that when we come back together, we might be walking into a building. And so with that, it does take about 10, uh, 20 percent for us to be able to put down. Uh, and we want to be able to raise about two hundred thousand dollars to be able to do that uh, because we will come together again. I know some people are saying, well, what if churches don't come back together? Oh, no, we're coming back together. You better believe that COVID may have scattered us for a season, but we are coming back together. And I promise that when we come back together, it'll be a family reunion. It'll be a special occasion. And so you're sowing into that. And of course, we still have our regular daily programs. We, we haven't had to lay anybody off, praise God, in this season. We have not had to do anything. We haven't had to make any cutbacks, but we've been able to add and be able to bring people on to do what God has called us to do in this season. And so as you get ready to give, I definitely want to pray for you. Father, there's somebody out there right now that's struggling to give. There's somebody out there that finances are broken right now. There's somebody out there with overflow, God, and they're, they're looking for where to seed, Father. They may have 100000 or 200 or $2 million to give, Father. May they, they may be just uh, have a cent or two cents, Father. Whatever it is, God, I pray, Father, that they give it from the bottom of their heart, and I pray that you acknowledge it just like you did with the widow of the might, and that you said she gave everything, and you honored her for that. And so, Father, we thank you, Lord, for blessing us to be a blessing. And I pray, Father, that we can release everything that's been given to us. We can release it unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Hey Amen. There are a couple of different ways that you can give. You can go to Cash App, that's Inspiration, dollar sign, Inspiration Church. Or you can go to the Fellowship One Go if you're a member uh, and set up auto payments there. Or you can go to www.yourinspirationnow.com backslash donate and be able to give there. Whatever amount you decide to give, we thank you because it's things like this that allows the ministry to go further. It allows people's homes to be transformed, allows mentalities to be changed. It allows marriages to come together. It allows people to come out of darkness into the marvelous light. It releases depression into the world, and it gives inspiration where there needs to be the breath of life. And so we're thankful for you giving. So, Father, thank you for the blessing. Thank you for allowing us to be a blessing. And we thank you, Lord, that the windows have opened in heaven, Father, and there is a release that's happening, an uncontrollable amount of release that's happening for the favor of those in their houses. Bless their houses, Father. And bless those that are struggling to give, Father. Release the demonic oppression on their home and allow them to be able to be released into the next stratosphere that you have prepared for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, Inspiration Church. It's a great day to be in front of you. Uh, we Last week, I hope you were feasting on something good. I pray that the old food that you had, that you cast it out, that you throw it away on Tuesdays and Saturdays or Wednesdays, whenever the trash man comes. And I pray that your life is now renewed. And this week has been the best week because everything that you've upchucked, everything that you've been able to regurgitate has been from the Spirit. And the Spirit has been filling you to such a place and doing such a work in you that your mentality has been transformed and that you can fearly, fearlessly say that I'm living by faith and not by not by sight. This morning, I've got a word. It's been a word that I've been toiling on uh, for maybe two weeks now, and I've been wrestling with this particular guy because he's 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 pretty mysterious to me. Uh, and, and at a glance, you can kind of skip over his life. But I think that in this moment, he's going to speak. He's going to give you some good nuggets. He's going to give you a thought-provoking uh, a position. He's going to change the game for you. And I'm praying that right now in the midst of this, activate and the young and righteous and the young and, 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 and rich, this young and rich takeover. I pray that in this season that God is going to reveal some things to you that is going to not allow you to sit down any longer, but but you'll get active and move forward. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word that you're about to deliver to us. We thank you, Lord, for you being in the kitchen. Father, we thank you for mixing the batter together. We thank you, Lord, for adding the milk and the eggs, Father. And we thank you, Father, for being able to put it in the oven, Father, and serve it directly to our lives. Father, I pray that as we take a piece of the pie, Father, that you've created for us, God, that was as we, as we digest it, it will create nourishment to our bones, God. It will make our minds, Father, free. Father, I pray that it will provide Provide healing to the joints and, and the ailments in our bodies, Father. I pray that the Word of God, Father, will bring healing to our hearts, Father, and, and transform a new start, Father, creating us a clean heart that we may magnify. We may magnify you this morning. So, God, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you have your Bibles, uh, Turn your Bibles to the book of Acts. We'll be in the book of Acts until we finish. So if it takes us two or three years to get through the book of Acts, we're going to walk through this thing because it's so rich and it's so powerful. And I want you guys to be able to feast on the word. Say, I am going to feast today. Today, I am going to feast today. Matter of fact, type that down in the comments. I am going to feast today. I don't know how long I'm going to be before you this morning, but I am going to finish what God has put in me. As we look at Acts chapter uh, 8, last week we looked at uh, Acts chapter 7. This week I want to look at Acts chapter 8 because last week Stephen uh, was, was stoned, Stephen uh, was killed, Stephen uh, he, he regurgitated a lot of information. He went all the way from Abraham and he went all the way through to Joshua and he was able to talk about the good things and the promises that have happened and they killed him because it was too much good news. They couldn't take it. The haters going to hate and we know what that looks like. But then at the end of chapter 7, we see this man is going to come on the scene and he's about to change the game for everybody. There is a man named Saul that shows up in the midst of this thing and it says that he is at, at the position where he was there when Stephen was, uh, was killed and he approved of it. 
And it says that the people came and they laid jackets at his feet. And when he got empowered there, as people kind of uh, showed their reverence and their honor there, it says, then after that, Saul began to go around and snatch up Christians out of their homes, and he was taking them over to prison. Now, some of you all may be thinking that this man Saul is doing something that's terrible, but I believe that Saul was operating under the spirit of the Almighty God. I believe that, that, that Paul, Saul, was doing something that needed to be done because when Saul started to imprison the, the, uh, the, the Christians and put them in chains and, and, and put them in bondage and persecution came upon them, guess what? Everybody began to scatter out of Jerusalem. And people had to scatter out of Jerusalem because before he left, he said, I want you to go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria, and I want you to go to all the ends of the earth. And how many of y'all know that you will not move if you're comfortable? You will not move if you are comfortable. I know that many of you are comfortable. You've got good paying jobs. You've got a, a beautiful wife, a beautiful husband. You've got nice kids. You live in a good neighborhood. And what happens when we get comfortable, we fail to move because guess what? Why would I ever want to move from this place? And sometimes what, what, the, uh, what God will have to do is he'll have to throw a stick in the mud and he'll have to stir the water a little bit. He'll have to create some, some tragedies in your life so that you can get your behind up and move and be activated. And so we see that Saul comes on the scene and it seems like he's working on the enemy's side, but all things work together for the good of those who and are called according to his purpose. And so Saul is, is creating riffraff. He's creating a catastrophe. And now the Christians are fleeing and they're moving off. And I want to talk about this one man named Philip. Type that in below. Philip. Philip, P-H-I-L-I-P. Philip was one of the chosen deacons, and he's scattered, and he goes to Samaria. And Samaria, if you guys remember, this is where Jesus talked to this woman at the well, and he told her all about her life. And she was a, a one that not only had one husband, but she had many husbands. And she went back, and she testified in, in all of Samaria. And now Philip leaves from Jerusalem, and he goes to Samaria, and he begins to preach. He begins to heal. He begins to teach. And as he's he, uh, teaching and healing, spirits are being lifted, uh, uh, power is being enforced, and people are following him. And so people of all types of cultures and creeds are now following the, the message and the word of Philip because they know that he has this power. And so they're coming in droves and following him. And there's one particular man that Philip changes the game for, and his name is Simon the Sorcerer. Now, I don't know if you know what a sorcerer is, but that's somebody that practices magic. It's somebody that practices witchcraft. They do uh, some things that come from uh, the other side of the spiritual realm. He's, he's, pre he's practicing dark magic, and everybody in Samaria knows this great guy named Simon the Sorcerer, and this is how he makes his money. He's a sorcerer, so when he comes and shows up on the scene, he'll do some magic. People will gather all around, and they'll be able to see him, and Simon is now all by the message that Philip has given. Matter of fact, actually, Philip coming to Samaria is actually taking money out of his pockets. Anybody ever came to Christ and, and then it seemed like stuff just started to fall apart? Uh, like, like uh, you know, I know how to, to make money in the street, but now that I got to come into the fold, I, I had to lose a source of income because the packages that I used to drop off or the things that I used to deliver or the things that I used to have somebody else sell for me, I can't do it anymore because I'm at conflict in my spirit. But it seems the more that I, I become closer to Christ, the, the, the lesser I have. And it makes it so unattractive to us sometimes because we're getting one thing spiritually, but then it seems like we're physically suffering. And, and when we physically suffer, it's easy for us to turn around from the camera and walk away. Because I believe that, that when God is trying to do a makeover in your life, he is not going to make you over with the same dirt that you would made for before. He's going to create in you a clean heart. And in order for him to do that, he has to purify you. And so this man uh, called Simon the Sorcerer, he has an interesting plight here because he's used to making money. Philip has come into the city. He is now uh, drawn to Philip's message because he has a different type of power that he hasn't experienced before. And so we see something that's magical that's going to happen here. Uh, we'll read uh, in beginning in chapter 8. Uh, starting at verse 4, it says, So those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. 
Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. The crowds were all paying attention to what Philip said as they listened and saw the signs he was performing. For unclean spirits, crying out with loud voice, came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Can you imagine going to a Benny Hinn revival? Are going to, to one of these places where we see uh, God's power being uh, exuded and in, 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 uh, manifested in miracles and, and signs. And, and you hear streaks. I remember uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, this girl had, I was talking to at the time, she invited me to this late night revival. And there was going to be a prophet that came in town. And he, he started to prophesy. And, and people started to throw up all kind of white stuff. And I heard all kind of stuff. People was crawling down the floors. It was all kind of strange stuff that I had never seen before. And, and what they were saying was that that there was a release of some spiritual things in that place and demons had to to come out of these people and I remember that so vividly because I was like man you know what I think I want to be able to do that too God and so I remember praying while they were I was like I want that kind of power I want to be able to 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 touch something and people just start doing backwards flips and they start bucking and people start delivering and giving up things and I said God I want that one but I didn't want it because I wanted people to heal I want it because I wanted the power And if we're real realistic about it, when we see something that we can't attain, we desire to have that thing. So much to the point we'll compare our gifts to other people's gifts. God has given you the gift of wisdom. He's given you the gift of knowledge and he's given you the gift to be able to to discern. But you want the gift of prophecy. And so you'll neglect your gift trying to get somebody else's gift and you won't utilize your own thing because you're looking at how God is using another person. And so this is what happened to this man, Simon. Simon the sorcerer is is following him. And as we continue to read, it says a man named Simon had previously practiced sorcery in the city and amazed the Samaritan people. And when he came around, he would say, I am great. I do miracles so great. He says, and they all paid attention to him From the least of them to the greatest. And they said, this man is called the great power of God. They were attentive to him because he had amazed them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip, as he came in with this new word, as he proclaimed the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized, even Simon the sorcerer. The one that was great, that did miracles so great, it says he even believed. And after he was baptized, he followed Philip everywhere and was amazed as he observed the signs and the great miracles that were being performed. This man who made his money doing uh, witchcraft and and practicing satanic rituals and doing things that that, uh, were not known to the Christian community and and doing things that were uh, put on by by the, the darkest kingdom, we see that he is now saying, you know what, I'm giving up this past life and I'm going to follow Philip. What he did was he He's saying, I'm going to create a new diet and I'm going to follow Philip because Philip is feeding me something that I haven't ate before. Philip is giving me something I've never experienced before. And I am going to put down my old life and I'm going to follow Philip. Now, many of you have come to Christ. And you've been following Christ for a long time and uh, you've been in church and you've been around church and you have been a believer and God has worked some things out in your life. And you are you are profound. You are uh, 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 dedicated. You you everything is about God in your life. But yet and still, there are some sorcerer things that have. Tainted. How you look, how you walk, how you talk and how you think. If we if we're really honest about where we are, it's easy to be saved, but still slide in our minds, if that makes sense. It's it's easy to be committed, but still cancerous. It's easy for us to be conniving, yet confess that Jesus is Lord. It's because we have a little of the Simon the sorcerer still in us when we come to faith. And so at this point, Philip's creating this big ruckus in Samaria. And now 
the big apostles, Peter and John, they hear about it and they say, you know what, Peter? Hey, uh, uh, John, let's go down and see what Philip is doing, man. It seems like this, uh, in Samaria, uh, uh, Philip is making a great ruckus down there in Samaria. So the big boys come. We know that when Peter and, and John come to town, people are lining up the, the people that are sick. He's lining up people that are, are, that are, that are depressed. He, they're lining up all of the, the people that maybe even be dead because they want to have the shadow of Peter come through. And so Peter and John show up to all of these people that are confessing Jesus and they're being baptized. And these people are saying that I want to be transformed. And so Peter and John are carrying the spirit of the Holy Spirit and they come to town. And in verse 14, it says, when the apostles were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. After they went down there, they prayed for them so that the Samaritans might receive the Holy Spirit because he had not yet come down to any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when they saw the Holy Spirit come down, Simon was like, I want that power. And so he walks up to Peter and John with a bag of silver, and he says, hey, give me this power also that I may lay my hands on anyone, and they will receive the Holy Spirit. I like Simon the sorcerer because he's not trying to get something for free. He says, I'm going to bring you some money. Hey, that thing right there, I like it. I'll buy for, I'll pay whatever it costs today to have that power. I don't see anything wrong with Simon wanting to, to have that power. But Peter, the same Peter that betrayed Jesus, the same Peter that denied him thrice, the same Peter that said that I'll cut a person's ear off, he speaks to him and he tells him, may your silver be destroyed with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this matter because your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that, if possible, your heart's intent may be forgiven. For I see you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by wickedness. And I was like, dang, Peter, that's kind of tough, man. Like, dang, all the dude wanted was... You know, he wasn't asking to steal. He wasn't saying, I want to take followers from, from uh, Philip. I'm not trying to be against y'all. I just want to be able to pay for this blessing. And Peter rebukes him. But you know what's good about Peter's rebuke? Has anybody ever been rebuked? When's the last time you've been checked? When's the last time? When's the last time you've been checked? Somebody check you lately? Uh, by anybody. You've been today you were checked by God today. Anybody else been checked recently? Had to be checked. When, when a person checks you, it puts you in a different state of mind, right? Because what may seem right to a man may not necessarily be right in God's eyes. And I know that any time that I've been checked, I always remember that, right? I remember when my coaches used to check me. I remember when my dad used to check me or still checks me or my mom. She'll call me and check me. I still get checked to this day. And when you live with a woman like Sparkle, you get checked a lot of times. I feel like I'm playing chess. It's checkmate. But when you're checked, those are things that kind of stick with you, and they cause you to they cause an alter to your behavior. And what it happens when you get to that point where you're about to make some of those same decisions, you'll think about that soft rebuke, and it'll change the game for you. And so Peter looks at this guy, and he says, may you die with that silver that you brought, because this right here, you can't pay for. As I was meditating on it, I was like, man, you know what? The things of God are free, but the things from Satan you have to pay for. And I was like, ooh, man. The things of God are free. He says he gives freely, but the stuff from Satan you're going to have to pay for. You're going to have to come off that bread because you're going to have to come off uh, uh, of the dollar. You're going to have to pay for it. And that's what Simon the sorcerer was used to. He was used to paying for power. He was used to paying for magic. He was used to paying for things. That's how the world operates. If I see something and I want it, then I'll pay you. But when it comes from God, it comes free. All he asks of you is, is to come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden. He says, and I'll give you rest. Now you don't have to pay for rest. And I know there's some prophets that are going around town saying that you got to pay for a blessing, but I promise you that God's blessings come for free. All you have to do is trust 
and believe him, but you don't have to come off of money. But this is what Simon's background was all about. It was about him paying for what he wanted, and there was nothing wrong with that. But the only thing that, that, that uh, Peter was saying, he was saying that when the Holy Spirit came to me, we didn't pay for it. When he came down to us in the book of Acts, he didn't pay for it. When he, when he rained down on us, we didn't have to pay for any of this, and we're not going to start selling it now. And so Peter made a good choice as a pastor by saying, I'm not going to allow you and take advantage of you. Y'all remember when Peter, uh, when the guy uh, came up to uh, Peter, he was broke, and uh, uh, he looked at Peter, and he was begging for some change. And Peter looked at him, he said, silver and gold, I don't have, but what I have. So that means that Peter wasn't the richest man, and here he is standing before this man that's going to give him a bag of silver, and he doesn't take the silver even though he may not be in the best financial position. He says, I am not going to sell you Christ. I am not going to sell my Savior because I know how important this thing is to me. And so I am not going to join you in your sin. And so Simon the sorcerer, and this is funny because if you read different commentaries, some people say that Simon the sorcerer, uh, since he was rebuked, he was no longer saved. But it says in the Bible, it says that he was a believer. It says that he was baptized. And sometimes we're a believer and sometimes we are baptized, but we still can sabotage. And if we don't have people to check us in our life, then we'll continue to sabotage over and over again. And this is one thing that I hate about this watered down Christianity is that we so, we're so uh, uh, passive, we placate sin. Oh, that's all right, man. You'll get over it. No, you need to look at somebody and say, man, stop cheating on your wife. Like, bro, that, that's, that's wrong. And sometimes we go to the extreme. But I believe that there has to be a healthy balance so that when a person is about to go back into sin, that they feel it. They say, you know what? Let me, let me, let me, let me stop. Because that's how the Holy Spirit works when he comes into our lives. He, he, he brings us a different, different mentality for us to be uh, uh, better at that. And it says that, that, that Simon... The sorcerer, he was used to being great. He would come to the city and say, I'm great. Like Ali, I'm the greatest. He was used to being great. And now to see Peter and John with this power, he like, man, I want that too. He wants to be great. And there's nothing wrong with desiring to be great. But if we look back in the New Testament, when, when uh, Peter and James and John, they were having that question, who's the greatest in the kingdom? He says, the greatest is the one who serves. And in order for you to be the greatest in the kingdom, Simon, is very different from the greatest in in the world where you came from. Now you must serve these people. I'm not laying my hands on them to give them the Holy Spirit so that they'll praise me. No, I'm doing it. For God, this is, uh, I heard this thing and I want to share it with you. So uh, my son Carson is a little over one now, right? And uh, you guys ever, if you've been around a child, and you may see something out the window, or you may see a ball, and, and you point at the ball, and then they don't look at the ball, but they look at your finger. And you're like, no, don't look at my finger. Look over there. And then they try to, like, point their finger to you. I'm like, no, Carson, like, look over there. So the other day he was playing with me, I think. I don't know, but he was probably serious. And I was telling him to pick up some stuff because my son, y'all remember Bud? I preached a sermon years ago, and I called uh, Bud, had a nickname. He was called Mess Boy Bud. Mess boy Bud would tear up a house. Now we have a mess boy Carson because everything he sees, he pulls things down. He eats a little bit of this Cheeto and he throws it on the ground. He takes this meat and he spits it out and he throws that on the ground. He takes the grape, smushes it in his mouth. He throws that on the ground. And at 8 o'clock, we have a smooth floor. And by 10 o'clock, it looks like all hell is broken loose in my home. So much to the point where I had to buy iRobot. And that's one of those things that you can put on your phone and it'll go and sweep up things. And Sparkle hates it because it comes on in the middle of the morning. And she's like, I'm an I'm a, a ET phone home. Get that robot out of here. She doesn't like it. But I love it because I got a mess boy, but I got an answer for that. And so uh, I was telling Carson, I said, Carson, get your food off the floor. And he went and got the water bottle and gave it to me. I said, Carson, get your food off the floor. Then he grabbed something else and gave it to me. I said, Carson, look at the end of my finger. Like, look where I'm pointing. And he kept looking at my finger. This is how Simon the sorcerer was. He was not looking at what the signs and the miracles was pointing to. He was looking at the finger. The finger was Peter and Philip. The finger was Peter, John, and Philip. He was the one pointing to the Holy Spirit, but he couldn't see the Holy Spirit. All he saw was the finger. And sometimes when we're babes in Christ, sometimes when we can't see what's going on, we'll look at the person that God is using to point back to God, and we'll praise the person as opposed to praising the persona of Jesus Christ. 
But he has to learn not to just look at the figure, but look to where it's pointing. Because as Simon the sorcerer starts to, to get discipled, he's going to understand that all good things come from Peter can't do it without the Spirit. John can't do it without the Spirit. Philip can't preach without the Spirit. This can't happen without the Spirit. Only good things happen when it comes from the Spirit. But as a babe, you may look at where it's coming from. And when you look at where it's coming from, then that's when you'll start to envy the gifts of people that are around you. You'll be filled with Bitterness. Now, I was going to actually do this whole sermon on bitterness, but uh, I, I couldn't. But I believe right now it's, it's time to kind of lock and load on bitterness. Bitterness, I hate dark chocolate. I'll just say it. Some of y'all are going to be mad at me. I hate, dark, anybody out there hate dark, dark chocolate? Dark chocolate is bitter. You like dark chocolate? God, pray for him right now, Father, in the Holy Spirit. I hate it because it's bitter. I mean, I love milk chocolate. I'm a milk chocolate type of person. It's sweet. I I really, really love white chocolate. Anybody had a a white chocolate uh, cookies and cream uh, Hershey's? Oh, my gosh. Now, now I can eat that, and I can look at myself afterwards, and I'll have uh, acid reflux. Okay, we won't go into that. But I love that. But dark chocolate, the first time that I tasted it, I was like, this is not of God. And if you have a taste for that, you can use this analogy in your way, whatever you don't like. But this is my time to speak, so I'm going to talk about dark chocolate. But bitterness comes from brokenness. Bitterness comes from burdens. Bitterness comes from busyness. And bitterness comes from a broken view of God's mercy. When we look a little bit further here, uh, Peter tells this guy, he says, For I see, and this is verse 23, he says, For I see you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by wickedness. Now, when I think about bitterness, I think about somebody, I think about the bitter beer face commercial. Y'all remember the bitter beer face commercial? You're too young for that. Anybody over the age of of 30? Yeah, you remember bitter beer. Uh, I don't know what year that was. Type it up, look it up in Google. But I remember the bitter beer face, and it was this guy, he would drink a beer, he'd be like this young guy that was 30, and then he'd drink this beer, and he'd turn into an old white man, and his lips would be curled up, and he'll have the bitter beer face. And I always thought that being bitter uh, was something that came from something that bad uh, that has happened, but sometimes being bitter comes from a lifestyle or a past of being taught something or being around something that may not necessarily necessarily be conducive to this new life. I remember coming up and, and I had a good friend named Carlos Lindo uh, and he was a Jamaican dude. And uh, if you know anything about Jamaicans, they make money all kinds of ways. Three, three jobs, man. And, and Carlos Lindo's dad, rest his soul, he was involved with some um, uh, street pharmaceuticals that he, he would do. And, and uh, my friend Carlos, he, uh, he actually took over the family business at some point, that makes sense. And uh, they used to have this stuff everywhere in the house. It was behind the dryer. They would have parties where they would be over there packing stuff together. If y'all see me, ain't Barbara, I'm not, you know, uh, let me take the names out. Don't, these names are not, okay, these are the real names. But, but this, this household used to have all kinds of stuff inside of it. And I remember talking to Carlos, and he would come to my house, and he knew that we were a church-going family. His family didn't really go to church, but he liked coming to our house because my mom would cook breakfast every morning, and we would pray together. And I remember Carlos, he would get over there, and he would be like, man, I love coming to your house in the morning. We get to eat those waffles, and your mom was always going to pray for us. And I remember one day, Carlos Lindo was at the table, and he was like, can I pray this morning? And Carlos Lindo prayed, and he wasn't a church goer. His family didn't really go to church. They were not faith-filled people. But this guy on that day, because he had seen something, he wanted to pray. But Carlos was becoming a believer, but he still had the family business going on. And so at school, he was still dibbling and dabbling things, but his heart was trying to go in the right direction. But there was this conflict that was happening, and he was standing on the street where he had to pick a direction. And that's how we are as Christians, is that we, we, we have this good thing that we learn. We got this good thing that we know, but we still have to pick this direction. And it's hard sometimes when you've got this bitterness that you've been brought up under to release it and walk into the newness of light. It's a difficult thing, and, and I think if we're all honest, we all got some bitterness. We all got some wickedness. We all got some perversion. We all got some con artists. We all got some, some brokenness. We all got some, 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 some burdens. We've all been positioned in a place where we've been bitter. And this morning, I'm telling you this, that just because you grew up bitter 
does not mean that you have to continue on the same path. You don't have to. Somebody has to check the brokenness inside of you. Somebody's got to say, hey, dude, that's broke. Hey, sister, that's broke. It's not working for you. That's not how you operate. We don't move like that. We move in a new way. It is broken. And when something is broken, the only person that can fix it is God, the Holy Spirit, and the people that are around you. Because if the people around you don't love you enough to slap you aside the head spiritually, then the people around you don't want to see the best for you. It says, for I see you were poisoned by bitterness and bound by wickedness. And then he tells him this. He says, pray to the Lord for me, Simon, replied, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. And so after they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they traveled back to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. The Bible doesn't speak anymore about Simon the sorcerer. The story about Simon the sorcerer is over. We don't see anything else that comes up about his life. But I believe that since Peter checked him that day, I don't think he's going around trying to purchase any more Holy Spirit movements or any power. This morning, my prayer is, is that as you look at Simon the sorcerer, and you understand the, 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 the beginnings and the precepts and the things that he's been through as, as a person. As he grew up, as, as this guy that grew up around this black magic, he grew up around this darkness, he grew up around these things. But he was willing to put those things aside. But just because he was baptized, just because he was saved, did not mean that he didn't have any bitterness inside of him. And if we're honest about ourselves, all of us have some bitterness inside of us. And bitterness will allow us and cause us to root for another person's downfall. See, even though Peter, uh, uh, Simon the sorcerer, understood that Philip had a gift, I don't think he was following Philip's gift to bring him down. But if you're bitter in a wrong way, then you will follow somebody and you will slander them and you will pray for their downfall. Anybody ever been in a bitter situation where somebody took your boo and now you hope that they both die in a car accident because bitterness comes from a place of brokenness you're you're happy when somebody else fails you're you replay a conversation or experience over and over and in your mind even so much to the point where you become the executive producer you're the director you are uh, the the stage manager you are the main typecast you are everybody in the play because you have played this thing over and over and over again and you are shackled and you are bound and it doesn't matter how many times you go to church since you're broken and burdened and bitter you can't move forward I'm praying today that this word will allow you to release to know that, hey, you need to be checked today. You feel angry every time you hear a particular person's name. You get mad anytime they walk into the room. When they show up, you have to leave. You are broken and you are bitter. And that poison is inside of you is going to relinquish and keep you down in a place where you don't receive your full potential, where you don't act out in purpose, when you don't move in your power, but you move in wickedness. And this is a trick and a trap of the enemy. You don't even believe behave like a natural person anymore because you're broken and bitter. But you have to find out how to let go and find God's healing. He says that in this moment when, when Peter rebuked him, he says, therefore, you must repent of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, your heart's intent may be forgiven. Now, I know that some of you guys have some things in your heart. I've got some things in my heart that, 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 that I think are good, and I have some things in my heart that I wrestle with. I have some things in my heart that, that I think are pure gold, but then I have some other things in my heart that I struggle with. And I know that it's a part of my past that I'm struggling with it, but the only way that I can be honest about it is just like Simon the Sorcerer. He came out and he spoke it. Why? Because it's been in me. I've eaten it. I've, 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 I've um, uh, meditated on it. I have uh, ate it for dessert. I've ate it for uh, breakfast. I've ate the salad. I've ate it for lunch. I have been eating on these things, and I know that these are some of the things that I struggle with. I know it. I know it in my heart, but the more I try to hide it, the more it won't be revealed. When we hide things, nobody can check it. But when it comes out to the front street and we can say, hey, this is what I'm struggling with, or this is what I want, somebody can speak to us and they can check us in the midst of our, our place so that we can get better. It's time for us to check the people around us. 
In order for us to really get active, in order for us to really have growth, we have to check the people around. I remember as, a, as an athlete, whenever I did something wrong, my coach was like, no, hey, Carlos, you'll get it next time. No, nah, he chewed my butt out. But the result of that was a college scholarship that was paid for. I'm glad he checked me. I remember doing some things as a child, getting caught in lies and some things, and my dad went like, oh, it's okay, son. You'll get it better next time. No, he checked me. And when we start to check each other, yeah, it may make you feel uncomfortable, but I know that when I go to sleep at nighttime that my coach in high school, even though he was not my father figure, I knew he loved me and he cared about me as a player. Peter, Peter checked him. And as he checked him, his life changed. And so what are you saying, Pastor Carlos? I'm saying this, that whatever you've been meditating on and whatever life that you've come from, whatever uh, things that that have been uh, rooted inside of your heart, allow those things to be revealed so that God can give you the passion and the potion to be able to heal your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. I love Philip because Philip went to Samaria, changed the whole game. But guess what? Since people were following Simon the sorcerer, Now that Simon the sorcerer's life had changed, guess what? Their lives were going to be changed because there was a sphere of influence that he had. And I'm saying this right now, that you cannot be activated and go back to work and be the same person. I need you to be activated and go into a place and walk in there and say, this is now my new master and watch people come to Christ. When's the last time that you've actually told somebody about your salvation? Because you're comfortable. You need a Saul in your life. I'm praying that Saul wakes all y'all butts up. I'm praying that he wakes me up, that he gives me a renewed mindset because I know that it's in the midst of the persecution that everything had to scatter in order for us to go forward. I know you quit your job this week. I know. They said you had to go back to work. You was like, uh-uh, I ain't going back to work. I'm going to quit. Guess what? You're doing a scattering. God is doing a new thing in your life. And there's nothing wrong with the scatter. Because when he starts to scatter things in your life, he's going to start to push that message out beyond the walls. I'm praying and thankful that guess what? You're no longer comfortable before. COVID-19 has disrupted your whole life. It has disrupted all the comfort. It has disrupted the gains. It's disrupted your finances. It's disrupted everything, your relationships. It's disrupted your patterns of life. But guess what? Now that it's disrupted, now I got to go and see God in a different way. I've got to go preach in a different way. I've got to go sing in a different way. I've got to go pray in a different way. I got to see God like I've never seen God before. I got to break away from this bitterness because the bitterness served me in my previous life, but now I must go before and do better. And so I'm thankful that the souls of our lives will come and intrude into our lives and make us change the game because it's because of his power. It's because of his greatness. It's because of his love for us that God is saying, I'm going to do a new thing in Missouri City. I'm going to do a new thing in Houston. I'm going to do a new thing in Louisiana. I'm going to do a new thing in California. I'm going to do a new thing in New York. I'm going to do a new thing in Idaho. I'm going to do a new thing in your bedroom. I'm going to do a new thing in your household. I'm going to do a new thing in your mind. I'm going to do a new thing in your personality. I'm going to give you a new because that's not who you were created to be. I don't want you like Pastor Jordan said on Wednesday night. I don't want you to be born looking like your daddy and leave out of here looking like your decisions. But if you do, I want them to look like the presence and the power of God. Simon the sorcerer is no longer a sorcerer of Simon. They can call him now Simon of salvation because now his, 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 his name was changed. His game was changed. Now he's not out there doing tricks and running tricks and playing tricks and making up tricks and being a trick. Now he is treating people to the Holy Spirit. Guys, it's time for the church to, to wake up so that we can be activated to do what God has called you to do in this season. You know that there's more that you should be doing. Type that down below. I need to do more. Type it. I need to do more. That is your declaration today. You've typed it in. You've written it down. I need to do more. I need to do it. I'm not talking about more of that foolishness, more chasing after money, more for a career. No, you need to do more in your spirituality. You need to do more chasing after God. You need to do more listening to God. You need to do more of your devotion. You need to do more in your salvation. You need to do more. I need to do more. We need to do more.
Because if the church falls asleep, then we're all dead. DOA. And so I'm praying that God, his power will reveal to us his might and that we'll understand that we're no longer looking at the finger, but looking at what the Spirit is pointing to. God's power is real. Type that down below. I need you to understand that God's power is real. It's the thing that'll change a dope addict. It's the things that'll change a depressed man. It's, it's the person that, that'll change somebody that's dependent. It'll change a personality. It'll change a household. It'll change a country. It'll change a context. I know right now some of y'all are unhappy with the president and we're looking at this new guy and the new person that he just brought on and we're looking for change. But guess what? Change is not going to come through them. Change is only going to come from on high. Because even though this person may be black and that person may be white and he may be liberal and he may be structured, it doesn't matter about them because guess what? They still got their own desires in their own heart. And though they may pick something and look good or do whatever they've got to do, guess what? My power and my plan and my purpose has to be dependent upon God's power. And I believe it, I receive it, and I walk in the newness of that. And so you may be like Simon the Sorcerer. You got some bitterness, you got some poison, you got some wickedness, you got some brokenness, you got some burdens. You've been walking around and making decisions, uh, running away from the broken pieces of your life. Matter of fact, all of your life is dependent upon trying to make your daddy uh, 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 jealous of your decisions because he was never there for you. Your whole life is trying to get back after people that have left you. Matter of fact, you have got this job so you can make your old boyfriend mad at you because he, you want to be more successful. You are living your life off of brokenness and God is saying, I need you to leave that alone. Let the bygones be God. I need you to release it so that you can walk in favor. You can walk in power. And you can walk in the mighty will of Jesus Christ. Pastor Jordan's going to come and he's going to give the invitation. But I'm praying today that even right now, even right now, even right now. Simon the Sorcerer is your story. You got a little wickedness. You got a little, you know, I want a little clout. I want to be great. I look at other people and I want what they have. I, I want that. I, I want it. I, I desire it. I ain't going to lie to you. I'm going to be truthful. I thank you for being honest. That you want center stage. You want, you want to, you want to be the greatest. You want to have it all. You want to be the millionaire. You want to be the person that everybody's coming to. You want to be the celebrity. You want to have fame. You want to have clout. You want to know what that's about. I understand because that's the bitterness that has been planted into you right now. And I thank you for saying, I thank you for being real. I thank you for being authentic. But guess what? That is not what's going to allow you to be great in the kingdom of heaven. And the moment that you can say, okay. Well, if it's not right, then show me where I need to go. And just like Simon the Sorcerer, he'll bring Peter and John into your life to be able to change your life so that you're no longer broken and you're no longer being led by bitterness, but you're being led, being led by your belief in God. May God bless you and keep you. Love you guys. Well, glory to God. Pastor Carlos preached an amazing message. And right now is our time and service where we give our invitations. Pastor Carlos spoke about Peter walking in the streets and seeing a man who asked for change. And Peter said, change I don't have, but there's something I do have. And he pointed him towards Jesus Christ. Right now, the first invitation that I have for you is to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you've been living life in bitterness. Maybe you've been going through things. Maybe you've never had the time or maybe you've never had the understanding. That's okay. Because right now is the perfect moment for you, to do, for you to do that. If that's you right now, there's three things you must do. It's as simple as A, B, C. Number one, A, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe that God sent his son down the cross for our sins and rose again. And then C, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Hey, listen, if you just made that decision, if you just did that, you are by far guaranteed a seal of protection by the Holy Spirit to enter the kingdom of heaven. I have another invitation for you. The second invitation that I have is for rededication. Pastor Carlos spoke about uh, uh, the sorcerer who was a man who was saved, but he made a decision that didn't look like his salvation. And we do it all the time. 
we fall by the wayside, we, we, we fall off to the side, and that's okay. It's not about the fall, it's about the get up. And so right now, if you want to rededicate your life, this is the greatest, perfect moment for you to do that. Just say this prayer with me real quick. Dear Lord, I admit that I've fallen to the side. I make the conscious decision to repent for what I did. And now I move forward and I move with you. And if you just prayed that prayer, what you have just made is the decision to rededicate your life, a change of heart and a change of mind. Now here's my third invitation. If you do not have a church that you're connected to, how could you, how could you eat these things and regurgitate the things of God? How could you, you grow in the community? How could you love, live, and lead? Maybe you're saying, I I'm not connected to a church, but you know, I watch Inspiration Church. I like what they're doing right now. I wanna give you the invitation to join Inspiration Church for church membership. If that's you right now, if you just type connect in the space bar, we do have someone who will connect with you and make sure that that invitation that you accepted is given to you. Well, I thank you all for being here with us today. Pastor Carlos preached an amazing message. We can't wait to see you all next week. But before we go, always remember to love, live, and lead. What an incredible word from Pastor Carlos. Didn't you think so, Jeremiah? Yes, that was a great like service. Like a, a shake in your soul kind of good word. Yes, ma'am. Like a get you through the rest of the week kind of a good word. Yes. And everybody needs that sometimes. So I think that if you happen to miss out ever on any of the messages that, that come across through Inspiration Church, you can always go to our website. And on there, you can find the link to our YouTube channel. But you can also find some other really great things such as church merch check me out i'm rocking it i'm rocking it you got some church merch jeremiah not all the way not all the way we're gonna nah. have to we're gonna have to hook jeremiah up with some church merch y'all but you can go on there and find some church merch too you can also find some info about our i groups some of our i groups are doing some really great things virtually so make sure you go on and you get connected so you can find out what's going on and be a part of it don't you think Yes, ma'am. All right. So so tell me, how do you stay connected since we've been quarantined, been locked down, you can't really see anybody? How do you stay connected? I grew, I, I youth Instagram, the uh, okay. youth Instagram. So he follows the social media pages, and that's something that you guys should do, too, to stay connected. If you don't know by now, you can follow us on Facebook, you can follow us on Instagram, and... Our youth have their own Instagram page, right? Yes, we do. So VIP youth, if you're done watching youth service, make sure you get connected so you can join us online on all of our platforms. And they're on the bottom of the screen in case you don't know what they are. Do you miss your church family? Like, I miss you guys a lot. Like, look at me closely. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. I'm an introvert, but even this is too much for me. I miss you guys. I miss them too. What do you do when you think about your church fam? Mm, to be honest, I just think about them and wish that I was still at church. We wish we were at church too. But in the meantime, there's one way that we can all lift our spirits and that's by staying connected and watching the services. And you know what? Even some of our groups at church have been connecting through Zooms. Um, so do you, do you know what Zoom is? Yes. Have you used a Zoom before? Yes. Awesome. Because that's one way that our youth and our kids, our men and our women are going to stay connected. Our men's group had a Zoom recently, and I'm sure it was incredible. So for all the men who missed out, make sure you join in on the next one. More information will be coming out about how to get connected and how to join and be a part of each of these groups. All right. I'm going to pray. You ready to pray, Jeremiah? Yes, ma'am. It's been a great, great service, and I'm really glad that you were here with me. Me too. Because it's youth. Taking over this month. And Jeremiah is. Taking over this month. Oh, right now. All right. So don't forget to tune in for the rest of the month as the youth continue taking over. But for now, we're going to pray, and we'll see you guys next week. Let's bow. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for an opportunity to connect in unusual ways, God, but still being connected to you no matter what the circumstances or the situations. We ask that each and every person who has their own struggle, obstacles that they're facing, God, that you would just meet them at the point of their need, that you would surround them in your love, that you would 
ever so presently remind them of who you are in their lives and that you are in control. And so there's nothing that is happening in their lives that you cannot handle because you are God and you can do the impossible. We thank you for this time. We thank you for who you are in our lives. And we just bless your name on today. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So there's one thing that we always tell everybody when we're getting ready to head out. And what is that? It's always remember to love, live, and and lead. lead. See you next time, Inspiration Church.